Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leslie Wilson, curator of the William Monroe Special Collections here at the Concord Free Public Library. I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth and final lecture in the library's thorough bicentennial lecture series. These lectures accompany the exhibition Concord, which is my Rome, which is on view up in the gallery right upstairs through the end of this month. Both the exhibition and the lecture series explore Thoreau's complex relationship with Concord in commemoration of his 200th birthday. This particular literary anniversary has inspired amazing, thoughtful, focused efforts here in Concord and beyond. It's been intense and exhilarating and a little exhausting. And I'm very glad that the library has been able to offer meaningful public pro programming as part of it. Special collections programs like this afternoon's lecture are supported by the Concord Free Public Library Corporation, the private nonprofit entity that owns, maintains, and establishes policy for the library's special collections. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Robert N. Hudspeth. It's an honor to welcome him back to the library this afternoon. Some of you might remember that he was here in 2007 for the joint Concord Free Public Library Thorough Society exhibition and lecture series, Reconstructing Thorough's World. Professor Hudspeth received his doctoral degree from Syracuse University in 1967. Over the course of his academic career, he taught at the University of Washington, Pennsylvania State University, the University of Redlands, and Claremont Graduate University. He's now Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Redlands and Research Professor of English at Claremont Graduate University. Bob Hudspeth has turned out an impressive body of scholarship, including books, chapters in books, articles, and reviews. His biography of the poet Ellery Channing was published in 1973. His definitive six-volume edition of the Letters of Margaret Fuller appeared between 1983 and 1994. He's currently occupied in editing the correspondence of Henry Thoreau in three volumes as part of the Thoreau edition published by the Princeton University Press. The first volume of the Thoreau correspondence was published in 2013. Volume two is in production, volume three in progress. When completed, this full-scale scholarly edition will include every extant letter written or received by Thoreau. In all, some 650 letters, roughly 150 more than in any previous edition. Is that true? That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Including dozens that have never been published. In addition, Bob Hudspeth has served as president of both the Margaret Fuller Society and the Thoreau Society, and he's highly respected by his colleagues. Inspired by his scholarly generosity and collaborative spirit, in 2004, the collection Lives Out of Letters, Essays on American Literary Biography and Documentation was published as a festschrift in his honor. Please welcome Robert N. Hudspeth. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Leslie, for that generous introduction, and thank you and your colleagues at the library for having me here today. Uh, it's an extraordinarily impressive exhibition upstairs. Uh, it's the sort of thing that really only the Concord Free Public Library could do um, and would want to do. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a grand thing. I first came here 51 years ago uh, to start my work on my dissertation on Ellery Channing, and I remember very vividly being simply dazzled by this room. Um, I thought that this is the way that a library should look um, and that I would want to come back here. And so I have uh, many times over the past 51 years, and it's always good to be here. Could you speak up? Could you hold the mic? Hold the mic. Speak it off. Hold it. Um, that'll be a little bit. That will be a We'll see how this works when I actually start to read. I'm ad-libbing at the moment. <laughs> As I was doing my paper, I was aware of the fact that 
uh, I was treading on footsteps much larger than mine who have been here before. Uh, lecturing to a conquered audience was something that Thoreau and Emerson and their friends did fairly often. Um, and I must say that it's intimidating to think that one follows in those footsteps. What I hadn't really counted on was the fact <laughs> that I have Waldo Emerson looking over my shoulder. That's intimidating. But one does the best one can. I intend today to speak to you of a body of writing that is little known for most people. Most people are interested in Thoreau, but they know his writing in other ways. This writing is at the margins, not because it's unimportant or uninteresting, but because it gives the reader a sustained, it fails to give the reader a sustained narrative. Instead, it goes by fits and starts. I mean, of course, Thoreau's correspondence, the letters between him and some 52 correspondents that span his life from 1834 to his death in 1862. I would safely guess that everyone in the room has read at least a portion of Walden, and many of you have probably read it more than once. Probably almost all of you know civil disobedience as well. From there, it might drop off. The essays Walking, Life Without Principle, the travel books to Maine and to Cape Cod, the voluminous journal. Sad to say, I think the letters come last in my speculative list. I know that, interesting as they are, they're not readily available in user-friendly and cheap editions. And I have to ad lib for a moment, with the exception of a very nice volume that my late friend Brad Dean did of the letters from Thoreau to um, uh, Harrison Blake in Worcester. You do, however, know one line from a Thoreau letter, Concord, which is my Rome, and its people who are my Romans the title of the exhibition that sponsors this talk. It's from an 1843 letter to Richard Fuller, Margaret Fuller's brother. Leslie got to that title before me, but I found another good one, and again this time in Thoreau's letters. This one was written to his mother from Staten Island in 1843. Concord, he says, is still a cynosure to my eyes. Cynosure, which means center of attention or attraction, derives from the Greek and originally referred to the Pole Star, the most important aid to navigation for ancient travelers. And indeed, the town acted as a cynosure for Henry Thoreau. How it did and what, it res what resulted from it are my topics today. A reading of the letters allows us to see Thoreau as a man living in a specific time and addressing himself to specific people. There is a common misperception about Thoreau that he was some kind of hermit, or at least an antisocial, truculent outsider. Well, he was often a stinging critic of his townsmen, but that's not the whole truth. As fine a book as Walden is, and it is a genuine masterpiece, its very success leads some, perhaps many readers, to think that this is all there is to Thoreau. He went away, he lived by himself, he wrote books, and sometime later he died. Every biographer has had to deal with that misperception, and one of the ways they do it is to turn to the letters. First, a few facts. Um, they change uh, from the, 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 the number that uh, Leslie just had. We have, uh, at this point, um, 646 surviving letters, of which 338 were written by Thoreau and 308 were written to him, and we know of 52 correspondents. Unlike the published writings, his body of material is subject to time and chance. Some letters are saved by those who receive them. Many, perhaps most, are destroyed. Or if saved, they're subsequently lost or destroyed. In Thoreau's case, we have, for example, absolutely no surviving letter to him from a member of his immediate family. None from father, mother, brother, or sisters. We have no letters written by Thoreau from Cambridge to Concord when he was a student at Harvard, though there must have been many. We know he courted a young woman, but no letters exist between them so far as we know. Thoreau carried on a long, intense philosophical discussion with a friend in Worcester, but only one fragment of his correspondence letter survives written to him. I would guess that with, with certainty there are correspondents about whom we are ignorant. 
So, fair warning, anyone who sets out to construct theories based on the letters needs to remember that tomorrow may bring new data. Not only that, but we must remember the, essay, the letters are not essays. They're not written to, they are written to specific individuals at a specific time under specific circumstances that may well affect their content. Let me use one example that involves Concord in an early Thoreau letter, written to Isaiah Williams, a man somewhat younger than Thoreau, who had lived in Concord for a short time, but who had now moved to Buffalo to study law. He writes to Thoreau to say how very homesick he is for Concord and how hard he has found it to adjust to Buffalo. He says to Thoreau, you are ready to ask how I like the West. I must answer, not very well. I love New England so much that the West is comparatively odious to me. To which Thoreau writes back, it is curious that while you are sighing for New England, the scene of our fairest dream should lie in the West. It confirms me in the opinion that places are well nigh indifferent. Now on the surface, the Senate seems to undercut my topic, for it dismisses the very significance of place to Thoreau. In the context, however, it's not quite so simple. Thoreau's trying to lift William's spirits, to encourage him to look about him in Buffalo, and to understand that nature is, at that place, something worth looking at. He also suggests that what we call place is a fiction of the mind and the imagination. Yes, Concord was important, but it was not the only possibility of being placed. <coughs> Excuse me. Another tricky part of reading letters is to remember that one cannot really demand of them a consistent philosophy. What is written today may well not be believed tomorrow. Here I'm going to borrow from Thoreau's good friend Waldo Emerson for an exact description of the inconsistency that I mean. This is from the essay Circles. Our moods, says Emerson, do not believe in each other. Today I am full of thoughts and can write what I please. I see no reason why I should not have the same thought and the same power of expression tomorrow. What I write whilst I write it seems the most natural thing in the world. But yesterday I saw a dreary vacuity in this direction in which I now see so much. Now I think Emerson gets it exactly right. We think all over the place depending on our current mood. At this moment I value this, I value that, but writing freezes the moment and leads later readers wrongly to assume that each moment is much like the previous ones. This is especially true when we write letters, for we write different people at different times under different circumstances. Letters are not the vehicle for sustained opinion. The more, that we've, more than we would like to admit, we're not consistent creatures. Think of the letters as fragments of a point of view. Still, we may be able to reassemble those fragments to make them more complete. With that caveat in mind, my aim here is to observe and try to understand the presence of Concord in these letters. I want to understand what role Thoreau played as a Concord resident, and beyond that, to understand what Concord meant to him. With some few exceptions, and I'll point to them as I go along, Concord is the place where Thoreau's letters originated. He wrote them here. The town and its surroundings are a background, one often unstated, but very much present. There are a number of times when Thoreau talks about Concord, when he becomes something of a local reporter. But whether or not Concord is the subject matter, Thoreau was often concerned with place, with the local. What it meant to be at home was significant for him and complex. The meaning of Concord was most often implied rather than overtly stated. Most obviously, Thoreau was a Concord resident who took part in the town's activities. As a young man, he was, a ch he was chosen as a curator of the Concord Lyceum, which meant that he busied himself writing friends from college to, elicit them, to solicit them as lecturers. Later, as he matured as a writer, he frequently lectured for his townsmen. He, they heard him define his understanding of the individual's relationship to the government. They heard his account of his trips to Maine and to Cape Cod, and he entertained them with his accounts of walking in the local woods. Concord residents were often his first and sometimes his most enthusiastic audience. They turned out to hear him, and he valued their attention. He took them seriously, 
and they return the compliment. In 1854, Thoreau became a spokesman for the town when he drew up a petition letter to Emerson. The undersigned, he wrote, wishing to enjoy equal advantage with their fellow countrymen at a distance, earnestly requests that Mr. Emerson will read to the Lyceum as many of the lectures which he has read abroad the past winter as may be convenient for him, including the one on poetry, though they promise to repay him only with their eager attention. <laughs> Not much has changed. <laughs> The petition is signed by 42 Concord residents who represent a cross-section of the town society. It's also very easy to forget that Concord was a, con a Concord businessman, a point which the exhibition upstairs uh, makes, uh, clarifies for us very, very strongly. At first, he assisted his father in running the family pencil factory and lead sales, and then after the senior Thoreau's death, Henry ran the business himself. Our collection of letters has a number of purely business letters about buying, selling, shipping, and billing. Thoreau offered a high quality lead for electrotyping, a process that had begun to grow dramatically in the 1850s. Not only that, Thoreau was a popular town surveyor. One letter describes him as being in the field for 76 straight days at a dollar a day. In 1859, the members of the Committee of the Proprietors of the Sudbury and Concord River Meadows wrote Thoreau to engage him as a surveyor. They were drawing up a petition to the governor and the legislature to remove obstacles from the Sudbury River. An area exceeding 10,000 acres of the meadows along the Concord River had been injured by a dam built at Billerucca to supply the Middlesex Canal. The claimant said the river's, annual, the river's unusual shallow drainage was compounded by the dams and other obstructions so that the large meadows on its banks were often flooded, ruining crops and costing a large amount of money. From mid-June to August of 1859, Thoreau was often on the river taking measurements of its banks and its bridges. You can see the survey of the meadows in the exhibition, it's item 138 upstairs, and the survey of the bridges on the river is item 24. Thoreau's letters reveal him to be an entertaining reporter of Concord's daily life, its news and its follies. There's a real pleasure in uncovering small facts about the past, for this gives us a more concrete understanding of what Concord was in the mid 19th century. These details aren't portentous, they don't cause us to reevaluate the local history of the town, but they do give us specificity. If one thinks about it, one finds one knows little detail about the past. We know big events, we read big speeches by important people, but we know little in detail about what actually happens from day to day. Thoreau was a man interested in detail. Facts mattered to this keen observer of all parts of the world in which he lived. For instance, in June 1840, Thoreau, wrote, uh, Thoreau writes an unidentified correspondent who had written him about the possibility of establishing a singing school in Concord. Whoever the author, he assumes that Thoreau knew the town well enough to give him the facts that he wanted in response. Thoreau makes it clear the town was already well furnished with singing opportunities. The town, or parish, he writes, contemplates a school the next winter which shall be public and open equally to old and young, learned and unlearned. The people have been accustomed to look at the parish for these things, and to them, a dollar ever has lost some of its weight when it has passed once through the assessor's hand. When I looked into this, I found the Concord First Parish supported public singing of sacred music from a singing fund that had originated in a bequest from Abigail Dudley in 1814. The town had long supported singing schools, which were created every two or three years. Did you know that in 1847, a Concord resident had a telescope? Well, Perez Blood, who lived just north of the town, had one, and Thoreau looked through it. As he says to his sister Sophia, I went to see Perez Blood some time ago with Mr. Emerson. He had not gone to bed, but was sitting in the woodshed in the dark alone in his astronomical chair, which is all legs, and rungs, and a seat which can be inserted to any height. We saw Saturn's rings, and mountains of the moon, and the shadows of their craters, and the sunlight on the spurs of the mountains in dark portions. 
Apparently, the low power scope so piqued the interest of Blood and his friends that they went to Cambridge to look through the much larger scope at Harvard. Here's Thoreau's report to that, written this time to Emerson. Mr. Blood and his company have at length seen the stars through the great telescope, and he told me that he thought it was worthwhile. Mr. Purse made them wait until the crowd had dispersed, it was some Saturday evening, and then it was, he was quite polite. The scene's a good reminder that Thoreau was not the only Concord resident who was scientifically curious and that he was on easy conversational terms with his fellow townsmen. I'm sure that many Concordians would have agreed with when Thoreau expresses his dismay at the prospect of having a muster of the entire Massachusetts militia in and near Concord. From August 9th to the 11th of 1859, the entire 7,000-man Massachusetts militia was to assemble in an encampment here in Concord. Thoreau knew what was coming. The prospect is, he says, that Concord will not be herself that week. I fear it will be most like discord. Thank fortune the camps will be nearly two miles west of here, yet the scamps will be all over the lot. The very anticipation of this muster has increased the account of travel past our house for a month, and now the last, the last whole houses have begun to, begun to roll that way. Thoreau is probably right to be concerned, for the Boston and the Fitchburg Railroad ran special trains of troops, and the town set aside 40 acres for spectators, and a crowd of 25,000, according to the Boston newspaper, gathered here in Concord. Thoreau's letter helps us remember that he dealt daily not only with the pleasures of being in Concord, but also its travails. He was not insulated from the scamps who undoubtedly raided his family melon patch. <laughs> some, of Thoreau's, some of Thoreau's best reporting in Concord was written to Waldo Emerson with whom in the 1840s he had several times a very lively exchange. Because they were neighbors, they needed to write only when one or the other was away from Concord. Such absences occurred three times between 1842 and 1848. First, Emerson was in New York lecturing while Thoreau moved into his home to look after Lydian and the children. Then Thoreau went to Staten Island for a few months in 1843, and finally Emerson left Concord for England for an extended lecture tour in 1847 and 48, again asking Thoreau to live in the Emerson home. As one would expect, the surviving letters show us a Concord from its domestic, domestic life to its political. For instance, when the railroad came to Concord, fires came to the woods, as Thoreau tells Emerson in its November of 1847. As I walked over Canadam the other afternoon, I saw a fair column of smoke rising from the woods directly over my house that was. But it turned out to be John Richardson's young woodlot, the southeast of your field. It was burnt nearly over and up so the, <clears throat> to the rails in the road. It was set by a fire, no doubt, but the same Lucifer that lighted Brooks' lot before that. So you see, your small lot is comparatively safe for this season, the backfires having already been set for you. Now this is news and it's also entertainment. The woodlot is a profitable property. The fires were caused by the railroad were increasingly common in this era. Less grave is the report that Thoreau writes about local politics. They have been choosing between John Kyes and Sam Staples, if the world wants to know it, as representatives of this town. And Staples was chosen. The candidates for governor, think of my writing this to you, were Governor Briggs and General Cushing, and Briggs is elected, though the Democrats have gained. Ain't I a brave boy to know the politics for nonce? But I shouldn't have known it if Coombs hadn't told me. Thoreau goes on to be skeptical of his conquered neighbor's attempts at world harmony. They've had a peace meeting here, and some men, Deacon Brown at the head, have signed a long pledge swearing they will, quote, treat all men as brothers henceforth. I think I shall wait and see how they treat me first. <laughs> I think that nature met kindly when she made our brothers few. However, my voice is still for peace. And is, as is often the case, Thoreau's reporting does double duty. It simultaneously informs and it entertains as he casts himself as a brave boy and as a skeptic of universal reform. 
Sometimes Thoreau simply records the local news, knowing that when Emerson was abroad, the, most thing, the thing he wanted most was the specificity of Concord. Here's an example of how a casual mention of what came to be civil disobedience begins a long train of local news. Lectures, Thoreau says, begin to multiply in my desk. I have one on friendship, which is new, and the material to some others. I read one last week to the Lyceum on the rights and duties of the individual in relation to government, much to Mr. Alcott's satisfaction. Joel Britton, who was a, a local wood dealer, has failed and gone into chancery, but the woods continue to fall before the axes of other men. Neighbor Coombs, the same Coombs who gave him the political news, was found dead in the woods near Goose Pond with his half-empty jug after he had been missing for a week. At this time, Thoreau was close enough to Emerson that he could describe a painful encounter with another Concord resident. Here's the way he dramatizes it. I have had a tragic correspondence, he writes, for the most part of it all on one side with Miss Ford. She did really wish to, I hesitate to write, marry me. That's the way they spell it. Of course, I did not write as deliberate an answer. How could I deliberate upon it? I sent back as distinct a no as I have learned to pronounce after considerable practice. And I trust that this has succeeded. And so the reporting goes. You get burn wood lots, elections, the lectures on civil disobedience, financial failure, proposals of marriage. They all interest Thoreau, who knew they would likewise interest Emerson. It's all a part of being a small town that can entertain through its smallest details. So far, so good, but there's another side of Thoreau and another role that he plays as a keen and vigorous critic who stands apart from his townsmen. Writing to his sister Sophia in 1852, for example, he explodes about his conquered neighbors who had been caught up in a series of seances or spirit rappings. The passage is savage, and I think it's quite funny. Though it's long, it's worth quoting in its entirety. Concord, he says, is just as idiotic as ever in its relations to spirits and their knockings. Most people here believe in a spiritual world which no respectable junk bottle which had not met with a slip would condescend to, uh, condescend to contain even a portion of for a moment, whose atmosphere would extinguish a candle let down into it like a well that wants airing in spirits the spirits are very like bullfrogs in the meadow that they would blackball. Their evil genius is seeing how low one can degrade them. The hooting of the owls, the croaking of the frogs is celestial wisdom in comparison. Now, all that sounds bad enough, but Thoreau's just getting warmed up. <laughs> if I could be brought, he says, to believe in the things which they believe, I should make haste to get rid of my certificate of stock in this and the next world's enterprise and buy a share in the first immediate annihilation company that offered to exchange my immortality for a glass of small beer in hot weather. <laughs> Who are the heathen? Was there ever any superstition before? And yet I suppose there may be a vessel in this very moment setting sail from the coast of North America to that of Africa with a missionary on board. Consider the dawn and the sunrise, the rainbow and the evening, the words of Christ and the aspiration of the saints. Hear music, see, smell, taste, feel, hear anything. And then hear these idiots inspired by the crackling of restless boards, humbly asking, please, spirit, if you cannot answer by knocks, merely the tips of the table. Now, I have to admit that part of this is written for the effect that it's making. He's showing off his literary habit of exaggeration and verbal play because he knows his sister will be entertained by it. Still, from Thoreau's perspective, this is, a con this is conquered at its worst and is a conquered that he wants no part of. It's, of course, easy to see Thoreau as simply a naysayer who withdrew from his fellow citizens, and the continuing and, I think, completely understandable legacy of Walden is partly the cause of this. And we need no, look no further than the opening pages where he uses his townsmen as foils to his experiment in living. Let me quote the whole passage for you. 
I would fain say something, he says, not so much concerning the Chinese and the Sandwich Islanders as you who read these pages who are said to live in New England, something about your condition, especially your outward condition or circumstances in this world, in this town, what, what it is, whether it is necessary that it be as bad as it is, whether it cannot be improved as well. I have traveled a good deal in Concord, and everywhere in shops, offices, and fields, the inhabitants have appeared to me to be doing penance for a thousand remarkable ways. What I have heard from the Brahmins sitting exposed to four fires, looking in the face of the sun, or hanging suspended with their heads downward over the flames, or looking at the heavens over their shoulders until it becomes impossible for them to resume their natural position, while from the twist of their neck nothing but fluids can pass into the stomach, or dwelling chained for life at the foot of a tree, or measuring with their bodies like caterpillars the breadth of vast empires, or standing up on one leg on the tops of pillars. Even these forms of conscience penance are hardly more incredible and astonishing than the scenes which I daily witness. Now this is not, however, a description to a friend, and it's not reporting. The passage is pure hyperbole. It's a literary device written to introduce a complex narrative that will critique what we would call middle-class life. To Thoreau, as he looks at his imagined townsmen, the people are engaged in doing penance for, for meaningless activity. It's a staged scene that pungently tells the reader that Thoreau had found common life so unsatisfactory that he can express himself and display his distaste only through exaggerations. Thoreau's use of exaggeration is a topic in itself, and I think it's a fascinating one, but let me turn to Flannery O'Connor, who memorably describes a writer's need to make exaggerations. When you assume, she says, that your audience holds the same beliefs as you do, you can relax a little and use more normal ways of talking to it. When you have to assume that it does not, then you have to make your vision apparent by shock. To the heart of hearing, you shout, and for the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. Thoreau was quite good at drawing large and startling figures. This is Thoreau at his literary best. Contemporary society is so vacuous that it must be represented in exaggerated terms. He finds it necessary to create a drama that pits his brave self against a grotesque town. But it's just that, a literary drama composed, shaped, and rhetorically necessary. If we read this passage as if it were reporting of the sort we find in the letters, we would misread both Walden and the letters. As I hope to show, Thoreau was quite capable of presenting Concord as both a physical place and as a construct of the mind. There was a real Concord and an imagined one. A better example of Thoreau's supposed withdrawal from society can be found in his best known and shortest letter, one he wrote to Cyrus Snow, a Stowe, the Concord town clerk on January 6, 1841. I do not wish to be considered a member of the first parish in this town. That's it, that's the whole letter. You can see it, you can see it by the way upstairs, it's item 81 in the exhibition. A few years later, when he came to write Civil Disobedience, he revises the wording of his withdrawal and turns it into a fiction. In Civil Disobedience, he says, Know all men by these presents that I, Henry Thoreau, do not wish to be regarded as a member of any incorporated society which I have not joined. Now, this is very witty, but it has a specific point. Thoreau did not want to pay a tax to the first parish after they had enrolled him without his consent in 1840. He was legally evading a tax, not withdrawing from the Concord community. The question of how Thoreau situated himself in Concord is more complicated than this note would lead us to believe. There are passages of the letters that mistakeably, unmistakably show Thoreau to be not at ease with his townsmen. Here's one from 1854, written to Harris Gray Otis Blake, his friend in Worcester, about whom we'll hear more about in just a moment. 
Ah, uh, he says, what foreign countries there are, greater in extent than the U.S. or Russia, and with no more souls to the square mile, stretching away on every side from every human being with whom you have no sympathy. Their humanity affects me as simply monstrous. Rocks, earth, brute beasts, comparatively, are not so strange to me. When I sit in the parlors or kitchens of some with whom my business brings me, I was going to say contact, business like misery makes strange bedfellows, I feel a sort of awe and forlorn as if I were cast away on a desert, on a desolate shore. This is a revealing drama in which he is the central character. Thoreau here exists on two levels. He's a conquered businessman going about his surveying, furthering the local commerce as well as his own income. He's integrally a part of the community. At the very same moment, he feels deeply his desolate estrangement from the community. He simultaneously is in it and out of it. At the physical level, Thoreau engages his neighbors, in fact, serves them well as a surveyor. On an emotional and intellectual labor, he feels himself an outcast. The passage does not explain in any detail why he feels the way he does. He is only reporting to Blake the truth of his emotions. He has surveyed the land and its inhabitants and himself. The work on the land has rewarded him with money, but it is offset by the cost of his alienation. From the roles that Thoreau played in Concord, I want to turn to the question of what the town meant to him, a topic that's more complicated than we have so far seen. Early in his life, the town and its rivers were sources of verbal play, Concord with the stuff of comic delight. Before he graduated from Harvard, he writes a classmate about an afternoon in which he sailed on the Sudbury River, casting himself as a Homeric traveler who landed on the beach to find the natives a harmless, inoffensive race, principally devoted to agricultural pursuits, and appeared somewhat astonished that a stranger should land so unceremoniously on their coast. Now, this is not the real Concord, but it's an imaginary one, yet it's a Concord still in its physical presence embodied in one of the, river, embodied in one of the rivers. A year later, Thoreau writes an even more imaginative, much longer letter to his brother John, casting both of them as Native Americans living in the pre-settlement Concord. In the letter, Henry passes along the latest political news that Albert Nelson has defeated Stetman Brut Butt Buttrick to be the local representative to the Massachusetts legislature, by, and by, he does this by turning both the characters into Indians. Our old men, he says, say there will, they will send the young chief of the Carlisles, that is Nelson, who lives in the green wigwam and is a great medicine, that his words may be heard in the long talk, which the wise men going, are going to hold at Shawmut by the Salt Lake, that is Boston. He's a great talk and will not forget the enemies of his tribe. Now this is all good fun between brothers, but it's also an occasion to exercise his imagination. Concord is here the material for the imagination. The town is to be used and enjoyed and turned into a literary performance. As literature, it's presaging the passage from Walden that I quoted earlier. Concord provided friendship for Thoreau. As Leslie has noted in her introduction to the catalog to the exhibition, Thoreau's friendships extended far beyond the town's famous writers. He writes letters to Lydian Emerson and her sister Susan Jackson Brown, he often mentions George Minot and Edward Hosmer. I've already quoted his reference to Essek Coombs, who was a local drunk with whom Thoreau socialized. That said, Thoreau found his deepest conquered friendships among the writers, Ellery Channing or Bronson Alcott, all of whom lived here in Concord with the occasional residencies of Nathaniel Hawthorne and visits to Margaret Fuller. Friendship was important for Thoreau. It was sometimes the subject of his writing. It was always in his mind. It was common and everyday experience in the town. I'll focus for a moment on Alcott and Channing, for Thoreau valued each of them and frequently describes them in his letters. For instance, writing to Emerson, who himself deeply admired Alcott, Thoreau describes Alcott's brush <coughs> with jail for a failure to pay tax. 
I suppose they have told you how near Mr. A went to jail, but I can add a good anecdote to the rest. When Staples came to collect Mrs. Ward's taxes, my sister Helen asked him what he thought of Mr. A, thought, asked him what he thought he meant and what his idea was. And he answered, I, vum, I believe it was nothing but principle, for I never heard a man talk honester. Thoreau's here writing in January of 1843, well over three years before he himself was arrested by the very same Sam Staples for the same crime of tax avoidance, and five years before he wrote the essay that we now know as civil disobedience. Clearly, Thoreau knew the dramatic value of the arrest and the escape, though he was more capable himself of writing that drama than was Alcott. Thoreau knew that Emerson would both share his admiration of Alcott and understand both the comedy and the seriousness, seriousness of the event. It entertained Thoreau, and in turn, he knew it would entertain Emerson. We have two Concordians sharing a complex moment about a third one. Alcott is remembered partly because of his improvidence, his stubborn adherence to the life of a philosopher that brought hardship to his family that is very hard to ignore. Moreover, he lacked the literary gift of language that marks Emerson and Thoreau. So he's an interesting, though shadowy, figure to us in our generation. But there was a triumph for him in Concord, one that Thoreau nicely catches in, a 1950, in an 1858 letter to Daniel Ricketson, a friend in New Bedford. You may be interested to hear, he says, that Alcott is at present the most successful man in the town. He has had his second annual exhibition of the schools in the town hall last Saturday, at which all the masters and misses did themselves great credit, as I hear, and of course reflected credit on their teachers and parents. They were making little speeches from 1 till 6 o'clock p.m. to a large audience, which patiently listened to the end. In the meantime, the children made Mr. A an unexpected present of a fine edition of Pilgrim's Progress and Herbert's poems, which of course overcame all parties. Now this is Concord that has rewarded good work and shown its appreciation to a man who had not succeeded by the world's notion of success. Thoreau had long known and admired Alcott, and he knew that all too few in Concord shared his opinion. The moment of triumph deserved to be recorded. But if Alcott was a misunderstood genius, Ellery Channing topped him. The son of a distinguished Boston doctor and nephew, and nephew of the great Reverend William Ellery Channing, for whom he was named, Ellery Channing was determined to be a poet, even if it meant poverty, which it did, or obscurity, which it did. Thoreau, however, valued Channing for ways in, in ways that he did no other man, Emerson included. Ellery was the frequent walking companion in, in the Concord woods, and Thoreau never seemed to tire of his mercurial temper. An early description catches it well, written to Emerson. I see Channing often, Thoreau says, he goes often to Alcott and confides, confides that he has made a great discovery in him and gives vent to his admiration or his confusion in characteristic exaggerations. But between this extreme and that, you may get a fair report and draw an inference if you can. Sometimes he will ride a broomstick. Still, there is nothing to keep him up but a certain centrifugal force of, a centrifugal force of whim, which is soon spent, and there lies your stick not worth picking up to sweep an oven with now. His accustomed path is strewn with him, but then again, perhaps for the most part, he sits on the cliffs amid the lichens or flits on noiseless pinions like the barred owl in the daytime as wise and unobserved. Not only does Channing share Thoreau's interest in Alcott, but like Alcott, Channing has chosen a life of serious writing. Channing is eccentric, he may exaggerate, but Thoreau has seen something else in him. He knows how to be quiet and to observe. For Thoreau, Channing may be the consummate Concordian. He is complex, entertaining, and deeply devoted to his writing, all at once. I suspect that Thoreau also saw something of himself in Channing's wild exaggerations. I think Ellery was simultaneously a warning and a confirmation. A man who indeed walked to his own drummer, but whose poetry never attained what it might have with more thought and more care. 
The writers were peers. They were fellow readers from whom Thoreau could borrow books. He could discuss Plato with Alcott and Carlyle with Emerson. They were fellow writers whose works he read and responded to, and they read and responded to his. As he says to Lydian Emerson, what wealth is it to have such friends that we cannot think of them without elevation? I think it is also telling that both Channing and Alcott, to some degree, fell outside of the respectability in town, just as Thoreau did to some of its less, uh, to some of its more conventional minds. The title of the library's exhibition and to this talk make it clear that the fact of Concord was on Thoreau's mind. In a homesick letter to Lydian Emerson written from Staten Island in 1841, he says he feels, quote, like the man who, when forbidden to tread on English ground, carried Scottish ground in his boots. I carry Concord ground in my boots and in my hat. Am I not made of Concord dust? It sounds as if Thoreau imagines himself having been created like Adam, but now cast out of his Eden call Concord. There was a nature on Staten Island, but it was not the nature that Thoreau had invested himself in and that he knew in such great detail. Not all nature was the same. He was not at home on Staten Island. He wasn't placed there, either emotionally or intellectually. For that reason, we can see that Concord was a defining place. It was a center that he never forsook. One tends to forget how much Thoreau traveled. He went to Maine three times, to Cape Cod three times, to Canada, to the White Mountains, to the more local mountains, to cities around Massachusetts to lecture, and to Minnesota for his health. He was surprisingly often on the road. But I would emphasize the fact that he always returned. He stayed in Concord by choice, despite the several opportunities, all of which were conveyed to him in his correspondence, that he was offered to move to some new place. Isaac Hecker urged, Con uh, urged Thoreau to Europe for a walking expedition. Horace Greeley seriously solicited Thoreau to move to New York City and be the tutor for the, for the Greeley children. And Thoreau entertained the idea long enough for the two of them to talk about actual salary. His good friend in New Bedford, Daniel Ricketson, offered to buy Thoreau a small island in the Middleboro Ponds if he would move down there. Thoreau's reply to Ricketson may stand for his reply to all of them. I am engaged to Concord, he says, and my very private pursuits by 10,000 ties, and it would be suicide to rend them. He was not about to commit that sort of suicide, but he didn't just ignore the question of where to live. For on several occasions, he directly discusses the relationship between staying at home and going abroad. In 1843, while living on Staten Island, he writes Emerson and quotes Abu Musa, an Arab philosopher, staying at home is the heavenly way. The very next year, he wavered in his response to Isaac Hecker, saying far travel, very far travel or travail comes near to me to be the worth of staying home. A decade later, he put it quite bluntly to Rickardson, I have a genuine genius for staying home. <laughs> but still, he traveled. Concord provided the emotional and the physical security to make sojourning only possible but rewarding. He always had a place to come back to. A comment written to Alcott lets us understand at least one way in which staying and going were bound up fruitfully for Thoreau. In 1856, when Alcott was living temporarily in Connecticut, Thoreau expresses a wish to visit the Connecticut River Valley. I also wish to get some hints from September on the, on the Connecticut to help me understand the season on the Concord, to snuff the musty fragrance of the de decaying year in the primitive woods. This brief comment shows clearly that traveling was one way to see Concord in new forms and to see it better. The ability to compare and contrast was important to Thoreau, for he was a collector of detail. Going abroad was a version of knowing home much better. However, being at home and being placed did not mean that Thoreau was always satisfied. Concord could still show him the dark side of human life, the side he most wanted to escape. Here's a telling moment written again to Harrison Blake in Worcester. 
Thoreau had a habit of writing to Blake about, a topic on how, about the topic about how to live. There's an ethical thread that binds up the extensive correspondence between the two, so it's not unusual to find the somber admission from Thoreau after he had spent several days in the field surveying for his townsmen. I find it, as ever, very unprofitable to have much to do with men, he says. It is sowing the wind, but not even reaping the whirlwind, only reaping an unprofitable calm and stagnation. Our conversation is a smooth and civil and never-ending speculation merely. He goes on to say, I have seen more men than usual lately, and as well as I was acquainted with one, I am surprised to find what vulgar fellows they are. They do a little business commonly every day in order to pay their board, and then they congregate in sitting rooms and feebly fabulate and paddle in the social slush. <laughs> Underneath this criticism of other men, I hear a fear, a fear that Thoreau felt lest he himself paddle in that social slush. He was forever reading his environment, looking at the facts before him, whether they were the facts of the organic world, of the, of, uh, in nature or the social world of his neighbors. One might say that his life was devoted to paying ever closer attention to the smaller details of living. Thoreau was always insistent on understanding what he ob observed, and what he observed here was the way of life that he intensely tried to avoid. Concord's inhabitants were full of lessons for him. The problem was how to read them aright and avoid the common failures of other men. He is applying the same mental habits he formed in observing nature as he observes other men. As a result, I think the moment, in moments like this, Thoreau is not concerned with judging others, but judging himself through his observation of his townsmen. <coughs> Concord was and is a physical place it's a home for people, a landscape rich and varied, a series of ponds, marshes, three rivers. All of that mattered to Thoreau, for he had an extraordinary capacity to examine the physical world and all of its manifestations. The satisfactions that Concord offered him appear to be endless. But that's only the beginning of an answer to what Concord meant for Thoreau. For the very physicality of Concord allowed him to experience and write about a reality beyond that material world. We must remember that he was a thoroughgoing philosophical idealist, a man for whom the physical world was not the final reality, for whom there was another reality beyond the physical. Thoreau defined that perception to Blake in a letter in 1850. On the surface, it appears to have nothing to do with Concord, but I think it does. Thoreau was on Fire Island, responding to the aftermath of the shipwreck that killed Margaret Fuller and her family. Emerson and the Fuller family had sent Thoreau there to try to recover any bodies that might be and the belongings that might have washed up. After it was all over, he wrote to Blake this. I find the actual events, notwithstanding their singular prominence, which we all allow them, are far less real than the creation of my imagination. They are truly visionary and insignificant. All that we commonly call life and death affect me less than my dreams. I have here in my pocket a button which I ripped off the coat of the Marcus of Osley on the seashore the other day. Held up, it intercepts the light, an actual button and yet all the life it is connected with is less substantial to me and interests me less than my faintest dream. Our thoughts are the epochs of our lives. All else is but a journal of the winds that blew while we were here. I find this confession of faith to be revealing in many ways, one of which helps us understand Thoreau's attachment to Concord. The town was real, physical, and complex, but it also fed Thoreau's imagination, and imagination was paramount for him. In short, Concord did not intrude itself, but instead fed his thoughts, those epochs of his life. The town satisfied his bodily needs, but more importantly, it worked as part of his imagination. 
It is an abiding paradox that this writer, who was so attuned to the physical world, who walked the woods daily, who kept scrupulous records about the changes of each season, was a writer for whom the physical world was finally not the point. He had an uncanny ability simultaneously to entertain a genuine commitment to nature and to the immaterial reality that lies behind it. You may notice here I'm quoting a lot of letters from Harry Blake, the letters to Harry Blake. These are the letters that most clearly reveal the concord of the mind. Here's a direct example of how concord in the presence of the Assabet River could, in Thoreau's letter, become something more than mere water. Thoreau's writing Blake to thank him for visiting him for a boating expedition that they took on the Assabet. If, forgetting the allurement of the world, he writes, I could drink deeply enough of the river, if cast adrift from its shore, I could with complete integrity float on it. I should never be seen on the mill dam again. If there is any depth in me, there is a corresponding depth in it. It is the cold blood of the gods. I paddle and bathe in their artery. The river, who shall say exactly whence it came and whither it goes, does aught that flows from, come from higher sources? Many things drift downward on the surface which would enrich a man if he could only be on the alert all day and every day, and the nights are as long as the days. Here Thoreau describes his idealist vision, shed the allurements of the world, immerse oneself in the physical, and then experience the artery of the gods. Finally, and all, all of this depends on being on the alert every day and all day. This is the possibility of Concord. This is the enticing vision of what it could be. It is here that Thoreau reaches his deepest meaning of what Concord was for him. And he was at home in both those worlds. Thoreau's persistent interest in the mind and the unseen reality of its, behind it at its purest was aided and abetted by a concord that could reconfigure in his mind. Again to Blake, he says, it should not be in vain that these things are shown to us from day to day. Is not each withered leaf that I see on my walk something which I have traveled to find? Traveled who can tell how far? What a fool he must be who thinks his El Dorado is anywhere but where he lives. The search for the fabled treasure of El Dorado begins and ends at home. At every turn, the letters like his public writing confront us with the paradoxes that the man who traveled abroad also traveled much and conquered. The man who was devoted to nature was equally devoted to spirit. The man who was troubled by his townsmen was devoted to them. Thoreau spent his adult life examining and recording the immediate world in great detail for a number of reasons. One of these was to find the material for figures of speech and concrete and figures of speech for his writing. And Concord was his place, found its place in his mix of nature, metaphor, and philosophy. I think it revealing that in the letters, Thoreau finds Concord useful in several letters, but he never talks about the Concord of history. The town, after all, had quite a deep history and one which he knew quite well, but he does not invoke that history in his correspondence. When Concord appears in the letters, it appears in the present tense. And so we come back to the beginning. On the eve of his move to Staten Island, Thoreau writes, I expect to leave Concord, which is my Rome, and its people who are my Romans. It is, the Rome, it is Rome of the Republic, not the Rome of the Empire, I think, that Thoreau must mean. His Rome and Concord is devoted to the res publica, the common good, from which we derive our English word republic. A town of that sort, Thoreau intimates, breeds citizens with Roman virtues of constancy, dignity, and truth. His Massachusetts Rome embodies private virtues in its public presence. Thoreau's Rome most surely did not correspond exactly with the actual conqueror of the 1840s and 50s, but that's not the point. In his mind, the two merged, and from that merge, he could draw strength and, and encouragement. If he thought the town could stand for the res publica, he knew that there was a part for him to play. As long as Concord was a sinecure, he knew where to steer. 
I've saved, what I th I've saved for what I think is the most telling and meaningful example of Thoreau's relationship to his Rome in a February 1954 letter. Then Thoreau had measured a piece of land for his cousin George Thatcher. Thatcher was one of three legatees of Deacon Reuben Brown who had recently died. Here's Thoreau's description. Measuring on Mr. Hubbard's plans of 1836 and 1852, which I enlarged, I make the whole area wanted for a cemetery 16 acres and 114 rods. That includes a path one rod wide on the north side of the wood next to the meadow and all of the brown farm north of the new road, except for the meadow of about seven acres and a small triangle about a dozen rods next to the agricultural land. The above result is probably accurate within a half an acre. Nearer I cannot come without a resurvey. The town of Concord later bought the land to create what they called a New Hill Burying Ground. When it was dedicated in 1855, it was named Sleepy Hollow. So what we have in this letter is Thoreau helping to create Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in which he is buried. I can't think of a more apt symbol. Thoreau, the Concord surveyor, helped create the place where he would forever lie. He lived here, he died here, he remains here. His identification with the town is complete. I quoted earlier his question, am I not made of Concord dust? Well, yes, then and now, dust to dust. His remains are the very soil of Concord in the very place he defined both with his surveying instrument and with his pen. Thank you very much. Do you have any speculations on why he never married? Um, no. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll just with you a moment, I'll, I'll give you a serious answer. I think the question would be, why did he entertain the idea in the first place? Um, Thoreau apparently um, did not respond sexually in the way that we expect people to respond, as, as far as we can tell. We have almost no evidence of this. My, my serious answer is we, we simply don't know. Um, if we had the letters between him and the young lady, whose name, of course, is fleeing from my mind as I speak, uh, we, we might know more. Uh, all we have are secondhand accounts from friends and family writing to each other. Um, but no, we don't, we, we, we don't know. He, 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 had close relation, he had close friendships with women. Um, he was very close to Emerson's wife, Lydian. He has letters to her that sound you know, three quarters like love letters. Um, it's there. She was older than he. Um, he was in Staten Island. He was homesick. He was lonely. She had he had lived with her while Emerson was was away earlier. He was a close friend, and he he felt very strongly for her. He also was a good friend of her sister, um, Susan Brown, um, Susan Jackson Brown, uh, whose husband had left her. He just simply up and disappeared. Um, so that he, 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 and Elizabeth Hoare was a childhood friend. He grew up with Elizabeth Hoare. Uh, and they were close friends for their, their entire life. So uh, uh, all of this is just filling time. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had a better answer. Yes, in the back, yes. You are still the best lecture on the series. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, um, Do they comprise I'm, I'm, the text known as Letters to a Spiritual Speaker? Yes. Um, Brad, Brad D. Dean published a volume called Letters of Spirit to a, of a Spiritual Speaker with uh, W. W. Norton 15 years ago or so. I've forgotten the exact yeah. day, date. Um, I don't know. I forgot to look and see if they're still in print. I'll bet they're not the way the publishing world is. Um, if you have any interest of those, um, take a look on uh, any of the, the used book uh, market websites. 
uh, it's a, Brett, Brett did a great job. He was a terrific scholar. Um, and the book gives all of the 52 letters that Thoreau wrote to Blake, uh, one right after the other. And they're, they're, it, make, it makes very compelling reading. They're completely unlike the rest of Thoreau's correspondence. Something in Blake called out a philosophical depth in Thoreau that because we don't have Blake's letters to him, we can't quite figure out what it was in Blake that called that out, except the pretty obvious fact that Blake took him very seriously and was willing to, uh, to hear anything that Thoreau had to say on the question of how does one live one's life. So these, these letters are quite, quite, quite unlike anything else and, and well worth reading. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sorry. What, was it surprising to you that he didn't retain the correspondence that he received? And was that pretty typical? Well, I, uh, frankly, I don't, I don't know whether he kept it or not. Um, let, let, let me speculate just a little bit about this. Thoreau did keep uh, a lot of letters that people wrote to him. He, he, he kept, as near as I can tell, most everything that Emerson wrote to him, for instance. Well. You, you know, you might do that. Uh, that, that's obvious, but he kept a lot of other letters that people wrote so that, that they survived and then the family took care of them and one of the, uh, one of the rituals in the 19th century was when a, when a person died who had a collection of letters that had been sent to him that the family sent the letters back to the person who sent them. So I think the Thoreau family probably sent a lot of Emerson's letters back to Emerson. Emerson kept everything, thank God. Um, we, we simply don't know. There, uh, letters are such fragile and easily lost or destroyed things. Um, the fact that there's simply nothing from his family would suggest the family destroyed everything. I and mean, that's, that's my best guess, is after, after Henry died, whatever he had kept of letters that his parents and sisters and brother had sent to him, he, the family just got rid of them for privacy uh, reasons. Um, you know, you never know. Um, the, these letters can be squirreled away in somebody's attic, um, and then all of a sudden, here they are. Um, after I was deep into the work on the correspondence, a, a member of the family living in Maine popped up and says, oh, by the way, we have some letters I don't think you have. And sure enough, they had, um, I don't know, 14 or 15 letters um, that they had had in their attic. I mean, it's, it's almost the cliche come to life. Um, when I was working on Margaret Fuller, uh, published the first volume of Fuller's letters, and all of a sudden uh, got a letter from a descendant of her, her brothers living in New York saying, oh, I didn't know nobody cared. I got a bunch of those letters. So by the time I got around to answering him, he had died. <laughs> Fortunately, his wife honored his request that I see the letters and I got a chance to see them. It's chance. Um, some things get saved, some things get lost. You, you, you never know. Yes, please. Is it, is it not strange that we don't write letters anymore? Oh Lord, yes. <laughs> Someone doing your with your assignment fifty years from now would have a very short speech. <laughs> <laughs> my, my 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 joke is nobody's going to get tenure the way I got it. <laughs> yes, that's that, that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, it's it's just going to wipe out the sort of work that that I'm committed to of preserving these letters for the past. But it's going to devastate biographers and it's going to devastate historians. Um, Sure, there are other archives. Um, there are undoubtedly going to be recoverable digital archives of some kind. Um, the joke among all of us in the academic world is, oh, don't worry about it, the CIA has got it all uh, anyway. Uh, that's, a, that's a very dark joke. Um, yes, yes, it's, uh, stuff goes away, easily. But the email is not, is, uh, Posed replacement, but in fact, no. you don't write emails. No, no, like no, 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 no. I can't. I, I can't think of the last time I wrote a personal letter and put a stamp on it and mailed it. No. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. No, the, the the world has shifted, has already shifted under our feet, um, and the nature of scholarship, the nature of what we know about the past, 
is um, up for grabs, and it's not. Um, it, there's no guarantee that it's going to come out nicely. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll just um, let, let you know that at least the Radcliffe Institute is collecting <coughs> blogs. Uh, so, say it again. They're, Radcliffe Institute's collecting the blogs of certain women. <laughs> yes, so yes, there, there yes. There are some people that are following well, some uh, social media. That's right. Yep. Uh, I'm and. I think there are, there are even more doing the same thing. Uh, part of it comes out to be then, of course, the, the recovery of those. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about all those volumes that I did on old five-inch floppy disks back in 1984 and 85. I don't think there's a machine around that could, could read those things. <laughs> what? Computer museum. <laughs> Ariel? Having worked on both the letters of Thoreau and Fuller, can you speak a little bit more to their relationship, their friendship, their correspondence, sure. their association with one another? Their, their, their correspondence was, was brief. Um, Thoreau submitted some poems to the Dial, which Margaret Fuller was editing. This was the journal that she and Emerson had started, and she rejected them. Um, he submitted an essay to her, and she rejected it. Uh, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Dear sir, I, I don't find the essay illuminating. Um, and he, he didn't give in. He kept on writing poetry, although he didn't send it back to Margaret to publish. They were, they were, they, they were good friends personally. Uh, she was in Concord a lot in the 1830s and 1840s, and he was around and was a close friend and a neighbor of Emerson, so they knew each other and liked each other. Um, the correspondence between them is something like three letters. There, there, there just isn't much of a, a record. Um, he has a description of her in his journal, calling her one of the most remarkable women of her age. I mean, he clearly was, was impressed with her. Um, it's typical that when crisis occurred, it was Thoreau to whom Emerson and the Fuller family turned to send him to Fire Island to try to recover things. Um, let, me, let me digress, we'll just give a, a footnote to that for a moment. Um, Thoreau went to Fire Island and did his best to find what he could. Uh, Fire Island was covered with thieves who pillaged wrecks. There were lots of wrecks along Fire Island in the 19th century. And there were professional thieves who just descended on the wreck and stripped everything that they could find. Uh, so this was a well-established culture that Thoreau went into. Um, he went around talking to people, finding out who had what, and he went and confronted people, got some things back, found things. He wrote a long, what, a 14-page document for Emerson describing what he had done. Um, I went here, I went there, I saw this, I saw the other. Um, that disappeared. It, it just went away. A page of it turned up in a manuscript volume of his complete works, and that owner has made that page public now for some time, so we had that page. Well, um, 18 months or so ago, um, um, the Houghton Library um, was offered the entire manuscript and got it. So the, the, the whole thing is now at, at Harvard. Um, and we have it and transcribed it, and it will be an extensive footnote, about eight pages worth of footnote, <laughs> in volume two of the, the letters. This is a commercial. Um, <laughs> but this is something we've not seen before, and it's absolutely fascinating. The detail that Thoreau talks about um, in, of the thieves and their activity is just absolutely marvelous. I've, um, it, he, he, he had a really good eye for the world and a way to re respond to it and talk about it. So, quick question but a long answer. Sorry. That, Good. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a palpable difference between the style of the journal writing and the letter? Is, uh, was there a writing? Is there a palpable difference between the, the write, his writing in the journal and his writing in the letter? It sounds like. I, 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 I think so. Um, and and let, let me just reinforce the obvious point. What I'm talking about tonight is strictly from the letters. There are lots of other comments about Conrad in the journal, a, a, a lot, but I was focusing on the letters. The, I think the basic um, 
The basic difference is a quip that Thoreau wrote to himself in the journal about the journal. In my journal, I, it's I say to myself. He's talking to himself in his journal. In the letters, he's always talking to somebody else. And I think there is a, there's an absolute uh, difference in the rhetoric between those two. Um, the, the letters are more composed. We have some small evidence that he would write drafts of some of his letters to Blake before he wrote the actual final letter. Not many, but a few. The journal, well, he wrote it, but then he revised it. We, we, we know about revising the journal also. But yes, I, I think there is a difference. That writing for oneself, um, he, he, he knows he can always go back to that and look at it and read it and think about it or just simply lift it and use it. When he writes a letter, for instance, to Blake and sends it off, letter's gone. He doesn't have it anymore. He can't go back to it. He can't say, okay, what did I say about uh, chastity? Uh, well, I wrote Blake about that, but I don't have that letter. So there's a, there's a literal difference in how he composed his works. He could use the journal as he could not use the letters. But I also think that there's simply a rhetorical difference. That writing for another person puts you on, on guard, puts you on your mettle, uh, makes you think about things in a way that's different from just simply writing for yourself. That's, that's the way I've always looked at it. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, is there any correspondence between Thoreau and Any, are there any, is there any correspondence between Thoreau and Hawthorne? Yes, there is. Two letters. Hawthorne's living in Salem. He's the head of the Salem Lyceum, and he writes Thoreau saying, I want you to lecture. <laughs> uh, that's it. That's, 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 that, that's all there is. Um, they were, again, they were, they were cordial friends, um, but they were not close in, in, in any way. And they weren't good enough friends to want to write to each other. No. That's, Anything else? Well, then let's party. <laughs>